yes and no. I agree that we are and that we have been for a very long time strongly dependent on US um, companies for digital technologies and services. And I, I, I agree also that this is a problem for a large number of reasons. But I also do not agree with him because I don't think that simply striving for digital sovereignty is a possible solution for this problem. I rather think that um, this kind of idea of strengthening digital um, sovereignty is more like kind of a rhetorical move. Um, and it's it's a very vague concept, digital sovereignty. And by using it, uh, policy actors suggest uh, that we simply need to strengthen our digital sovereignty in order to gain control over technology and of, uh, over digital infrastructures um, and all these kind of services we so heavily rely on. And I believe this is only kind of by doing this, we only externalize um, the problem and it doesn't solve the EU internal challenge that we need to build a strong digital economy, which is based on principles such as collaboration, openness, fair competition, and respect of human rights. So personally, I think we need to stop talking about digital sovereignty at all, and we need to formulate very precise ideas about what we need to do to achieve a fair and user-centered digital transformation in the digital economy. So it's a very important question. I think you mentioned independence there, or dependence. I mean, I think independence is an illusion. Uh, also, digital is there to connect people. So full independence, we, we will never achieve. I'm not sure we should aim at that. Uh, also, because uh, people are sometimes happy with the, you know, with the solutions they find, with the platforms they use. Uh, it's not about that. But the, the, what we need to look at is basically what we would call um, sovereignty. And you also mentioned that, or open uh, strategic autonomy. Um, and when we speak about the big online platforms, which are important, we are uh, a market a market of companies and of, of people who live here in Europe, 450 million uh, users. Um, and uh, so this is why the rules that that are, you know, that are there in Europe, they, that should be respected, are should be given by Europeans. Um, and it should be, they should be given uh, in democratic processes. And this is why uh, the Commission has proposed uh, in December 2020, so two years ago already, uh, laws uh, to govern the big online platforms. So it's called the Digital Services Act and Digital Markets Act. Um, and the good news is that they have been adopted and they are already um, now enforced. And there's a bit of time that now comes into play to, for them to apply. And, uh, and then we will set the rules in the European Union, not only for American companies, also for Chinese and for European ones. It's not important where the companies come from. What, important, what is important is that we have a level, level playing field. And it's important for users. It's important also for the big companies. Also, actually, they like that because then they know what to do. Um, and it's also important for smart competitors because then they can actually, you know, grow up and and, uh, and have actually a chance to compete. Uh, one of the laws, the Digital Services Act, is more looking at the content to protect you and, and everyone, actually, uh, not only you, Craig, from uh, uh, illegal content, but also from harmful content, disinformation, for example, or we have seen, you know, uh, manipulation of electoral processes, these kind of things, you know. Uh, and then the other law would more look into the business behavior, more about like, you know, no self-preferencing, that you don't go on a platform and in the search results, you also see the same platform again, you know, preferenced by, by itself or open up app stores, you know, to, to allow smaller app providers, for example, to have a chance to actually be bought and used um, on platforms, these things. So it's, it's a long, long list of do's and don'ts that we have there, too long now to, for me to quote. But you see, um, yes, indeed, we want to give ourselves tools that are um, the here for whoever provides their services in the EU. And I can give another example. Um, for example, we have proposed an AI Act, Artificial Intelligence Act, also here. We want to set a standard, uh, as we already have done, for example, for the protection of personal data, which is the standard, the gold standard now in the world. And, um, and this gives us, in a way, uh, sovereignty, and it means basically we decide as Europeans what are the rules that, that are um, rated here. Now, let me say one last word. Um, of course, it also comes with um, with the means we have. For example, we have, you know, we are also dependent in a way, right? So we need our international partners to, for example, um, have the microchips that we need for, for 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 the products, right? So we currently have very few microchips that were, that we produce here. But we have very strong players. We have excellent researchers. We have a world leader uh, in specialized machines. They are called ASML. They are in the Netherlands. That you need to produce the chips, but you only produce roughly 10%, right? Um, now we want to go to 20. 
and the market it doubles. So that means actually you need to quadruple to arrive at 20, otherwise you will actually go behind. Um, it's very ambitious, um, but that means we still need to import 80. So uh, we need our international partners. We want to get less dependent on raw materials. And we have proposed initiatives on this as well, also on the chips, by the way. Um, but we will never be completely independent. Um, and I don't think it's the aim, but the aim is that we are sovereign as Europeans and uh, we have ambitious targets. And we, we in a way, um, decide how the digital space in the European Union is governed. Thank you. That's a really good question. I'll, I'll break the question down into two parts. The first is about digital sovereignty and then the second is about the role of, of the US companies. So firstly, with respect to digital sovereignty, I think it's absolutely clear that, that that's what Europe needs to be sovereign with respect to digital, with respect to all aspects of the economy, as we unfortunately have been increasingly learning in, in recent weeks and months. But the real question is, what does digital sovereignty mean? It means different things um, to different people. And from our perspective, it means taking an ecosystem approach, recognizing that the digital ecosystem covers a variety of different elements, be it from um, equipment to digital services, to, um, to the connectivity providers like ourselves at Vodafone. Um, and one has to look at how within that ecosystem, Europe can play a much stronger and more compelling role. Because what we've seen till now, this goes to the second part of the question, with US tech in relation to consumer services, we've seen a strong influence and in extraction of data, um, of a, a monetization of data uh, in a way that hasn't always been to the benefit of, of European consumers. Um, and we cannot risk that happening as we go forward when the digitalization of businesses becomes um, ever present. Um, and we need to have stronger European um, companies within this ecosystem able to um, service European businesses. And that for me is what digital sovereignty will mean. It's, it's having stronger European companies in fair open ecosystem, which is for everyone's benefit. So yeah, so it's a very um, pertinent question. And uh, let me again go to, into two halves of this. The first thing is to say that um, to some extent, when we talk about European sovereignty and national sovereignty, it, it misses a step in the sense that we haven't even got the European single market fully completed yet. So there is a step in this process, which is how do we complete the European single market, the European digital single market, um, to ensure that, in, you know, as, as I said in the previous um, question, um, European sovereignty relies on having strong European companies, and that means a single market operating to its fullest, so that the current fragmented approach can become a European-wide approach, um, allowing companies like Vodafone, but uh, you know other companies as well, to, to fully expand its role within the, this broad European ecosystem, which, which is part of the global ecosystem. The, then once we have a single market, um, and we can aspire to that, there is a, a very good question about um, to, what, to what extent should national sovereignty um, trump the single market? Um, and we, we're seeing this playing out a little bit um, with respect to the security question and some, some increasing requirements or proposed requirements upon us um, to only have um, some services or some um, technical capabilities located within a specific member state um, and not being able to service one member state from another. And whilst we recognize the importance of security um, considerations within the context of, of, of Europe as a whole, uh, we would not agree that this should be um, something that really fundamentally opposes the development of the single market and the efficiencies one can get from a single market to allow Europe to be more competitive again. And that's really what we strive for, a competitive Europe within a global economic race. And having um, over-fragmentation threatens European competitiveness and it's not something that um, we should encourage. And to, so exactly to Carmelo's question, um, that there, 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 there can be something of a compromise, but one has to look at the bigger picture and say, well, actually, if this is compromising European sovereignty and European competitiveness, then no, this is not a good thing and we would not support it. Well, it is a dig, indeed a, a bit of a tricky question. Um, so I think what Carmelo means here is probably that countries like France and Germany should not, on the one hand, take actions to, for example, strengthen their own national digital economy, and on the other hand, rely on Europe and European policy to regulate the global digital economy. And I have to say that I fully agree here. This shouldn't be the case. Uh, but I don't think there's any cherry picking to do here when it comes to strengthening the self-determination and our capacity to act uh, with regards to the digital sphere. In light of the, the global digital connectivity and the problems that we are facing here in Europe, 
Europe can only make a difference for its citizens when it works as a union. So European legislation, such as the GDPR, and now probably also the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, they have an impact on the behavior of platform organizations, not only in Europe, but also worldwide. So this so-called Brussels effect. And we can expect that at least hope that there will be also um, other effects and it will also be the case for other upcoming policy instruments. And if there are similar instruments and approaches within European member states, which they are, they need to be harmonized and act in concert with the European Union. And I believe we should not try to create any kind of competition between different national interests within Europe, um, but we should really act as Europe as a union because this will only make us stronger. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carmelo. It's, it's a tricky question um, and has several aspects. I would maybe um, start with the fundamentalists and go a step back. Huh? We have a single market in the EU. It's turning 30 this year. Um, it's important because it brings together now 450 million consumers, it grew over time, obviously, but this is what we have to do now. There's a principle of harmonization, but also of mutual recognition. This is how it all started. It is ensure consistency. So companies know what are the rules also in another country if they want to export within the EU. Uh, it means um, there's no patchwork of national solutions uh, when it comes to the market. I build a car here, I can sell it somewhere else. I can you know, create another product if it has a, a license in a way, if it's, if it's okay to be sold in one country, can be sold in another one in the EU. Um, and that means it's, for, especially for smart companies and especially in digital, um, it's their life insurance basically to, to start a business and grow because they can today build a business in a small town, to know where you're coming from, Carmel, uh, but maybe in your hometown and then export uh, their product their ideas or also their services, by the way, huh? because the digital is much more about services and about products to to anywhere in the EU uh, under the same under the same conditions. So this is this is uh, this is very important. But then, of course, um, so there's a lot of benefits. But then, obviously, uh, there come obligations with it. So the obligation is to to respect the rules that we have, um, and uh, this is what the Commission is for. So we uh, we making sure that the rules are respected because we are. It's called the guardian of the treaty. So whatever rules are there, well, we make sure they're respected. Um, I'm, I'm not so sure what we could actually single out in terms of cherry picking. So where there is a cherry to pick, of course, there's always national interests. And our treaties also foresee that for certain areas, countries can, of course, have, uh, you know, divergent views and also also laws. Uh, we have like tax law that is not harmonized fully, or we have, uh, you know, sensitive security, um, defense, these kind of areas, obviously, these, I mean, pertain to the, you know, national sovereignty of a country. And this is maybe what you, what you mean with the, with the balance between EU and national sovereignty. There are areas that are, you know, um, that are not fully harmonized. And, uh, but this is, this is the way we, we work in the EU. Um, but it's very important that the areas that are harmonized, and especially when it comes to digital, that here the rules are, are respected. And uh, the idea is also, it's not only the rule, but also, you know, to, to set a standard, to set uh, to set a benchmark, right? So when you speak about the digital platform laws, we set the benchmark for the removal of, of online uh, content. You cannot, as a small member state, go and speak to the big to the big uh, multinational platforms or the big international platforms and say, sorry, please, please respect my laws. You can try, but it's better if you do this together as Europeans. And you say, this is our market, and here you respect what our what, what our rules are. And uh, so therefore, it, it has a big advantage, actually, of acting together. And it's the same in other areas like AI. It's the same in when you think about, um, you know, uh, the chips are getting microprocessors production to Europe. There, there's many, many areas um, where we have a lot to gain if you do this together as Europeans. Well, I would first say thank you, Peter, for, for the question. It raises uh, many different uh, and very important aspects. Um, but let me start with saying that the, the social aspect or the societal aspect uh, is always at the heart of the proposal of the Commission, of the of the way uh, the European Union is working and and uh, and, and we as the Commission are, are, are thinking. Um, so I give you an example. Um, the Digital Services Act is something many people have heard about because it it will you know harmonize the rules. So I actually set rules for many countries that didn't have so far rules to tackle uh, illegal content, uh, content online, uh, but also tackle systemic risks. So content that is not illegal, but that is harmful. So you can think of disinformation, you can think of harms to children, right? Uh, it will put an end to uh, ads that target children, will be forbidden. 
and uh, to advertisement that uses sensitive personal data, like your sexual orientation or religion. Um, now, why is this important? Well, because it's about the society. It's about you have your boundaries as a consumer that, that are there and that should be respected. It's the same like privacy and telecommunications, you know, which is which we have a law on and which is, of course, uh, essential, right? <laughs> Always needs to be to be respected. And we have already many years ago proposed the law to extend that to the new ways because now we communicate a lot about WhatsApp and about uh, Signal and then all of the messengers, not to name companies, but just to explain it's not the old telephone that we're using. So we need to make sure that our rules are adapted. This is not yet adopted, but of course, a no-brainer that this is important. Um, so, but all this doesn't come to the uh, at the cost of hampering innovation because it's a very important point that you're making. Um, I would say to the contrary, because clear rules help um, the companies to know how they can innovate. So they set on the one hand a level playing field, so the same rules for all. On the other hand, also you know often protect smaller businesses. For example, the DSA does protect small businesses. The bigger you are, the more are, we, are, we, are your obligations because the idea is not that you put so many obligations on a small platform or a small can also be an app, app developer, you know, like someone, you know, a small company that in the end, they will never become grow uh, big because they will never grow, become big uh, because it's so, so much uh, requirement. So this is very important. Um, and then, for example, if you think about AI, also there we want to set standard. We want to have AI people can trust, um, AI that is, uh, you know, um, checked when it's a high risk area. For example, if you apply for a job, and your CV is screened by an AI system, well, there needs to be criteria that it needs to be, we call this human supervision. You have to have the, the ability to say, no, but sorry, I mean, can someone, can a human person actually look at this again? Um, now, if an AI does something to facilitate your life, um, to suggest the next song or the next video, well, that's fine. Yeah? Then don't, we don't need to have all these requirements. Then if, if you don't like the service, well, you use another one, okay? So the idea is not to hamper innovation, but to be targeted to the areas where it's very important. You have two criteria there. It's your fundamental freedoms and it's your safety. So the self-driving car that hits you on the road should also be properly checked, okay? But not necessarily uh, the, uh, you know, your streaming service uh, algorithm, right? And uh, so that is just, just an example. Um, and maybe because you spoke about the societal aspect, you proposed a law for platform workers. That was in December 2021. So that was last year, like one year ago on. Uh, here, the idea is to have a criteria that, you know, to check who is actually a proper worker. Because many platforms, they use people to work, who work for them, but they are not classified as workers, so they don't enjoy the benefits. So the idea is here to see, okay, I mean, if you really work for, for a platform as a worker, well, they should be a worker. And we think that between 1.7 million and 4.1 million people would actually come under this status, right? And then it means once this is enforced, right, you're not there yet, but then rest time, paid holidays, parental leave if you want, you know, minimum wage in the country where it's offered, that is not harmonized in the EU, but if there's a minimum wage, you should also then be entitled. Um, health protection, safety, so, I mean, all other social benefits. So this is very important. So you see, we, we tackle, I mean, in, in a way, there's maybe not one law, but we tackle the, the, the problem and, and the concern that you have is also ours, so we take it from the different angles wherever we, we come across it. And of course, uh, to finish with this, we have very strong consumer protection standards, that's very important. And we have, and I mentioned it before, the, the strictest uh, data protection, personal data protection standards in the world. Uh, it's become a gold standard um, and, and many other jurisdictions follow us because they've seen this is very beneficial and, uh, and consumers expect it uh, more and more. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with Peter that we need to strive for this very good balance between strong social protection on the one hand and a digital market that allows for fair competition and innovation. This is what Europe stands for, that what Europe should stand for. And it really should, this is what it should do with regards to the digital economy. I just don't think that the idea of digital sovereignty does express this idea at all. Digital sovereignty is not uh, some kind of economic rationality. It's a very poor concept that, for a number of reasons, became the key concept to describe European strive for more self-determination uh, in with regards to digital transformation in all different kind of fields, including the economy, but also other fields. And let's say if we really try to stand have a very large understanding of digital sovereignty and understand it as the capacity of, of European nations, but also European citizens to keep control over the digital technologies and services we use, 
we need to think this through and ask what it really means for European digital economy. I think it means that we should build a digital economy that is based on values such as collaboration, openness and sustainability. And this does not mean that we need to kind of grow our own European tech giants in order to compete with US companies um, and have a very innovative and competitive market. I rather think that it means that we need to invest and incentivize uh, more collaborative, uh, collab collaborative um, kind of projects. And we also need to um, invest into free and open software, uh, source software. We need to invest into open standards, uh, data sharing and digital services and technologies that are sustainable both in the ecological and in the social um, sense. I think Peter absolutely nails it <laughs> in his question. It, and it must be the vision that we aspire to. So, I, I mean, he, he talks about European digital sovereignty being a, a reaction and a, and a way of avoiding greater um, protectionism and um, having more faith in the market, which we believe in. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think that the other side of, of this is, it's not just about protectionism, it's also about the degree of market intervention. Um, we, we, we see digital sovereignty, again, taking an ecosystem approach, looking at Europe as a whole, as a way of putting more faith in the market, avoiding having to implement protectionist um, policies because European companies are able to grow and expand and, and get to scale, um, and also avoid having an over-interventionist approach because European companies with European values around privacy, around consumer protection, will take on a greater role within the digital ecosystem. So will European business, will European digital businesses be servicing European industries <coughs> and ensuring that the value of European data, <coughs> excuse me, sits within Europe? Yes, that, that is the vision we aspire to. Is it a vision that will um, come about through a fragmented approach to the market? No, it will not. Is it a vision which will come about through a single market approach where European operators are able to scale, able to provide digital services at, at pace? Yes, it is. And then we will have European values with European digital ecosystems and a, a more competitive Europe in the world. So absolutely, I agree with Peter. Digital sovereignty, if we get it right, what it means for Europe can mean that we don't have to be over protectionist, we don't have to be over interventionist, and European businesses of all shapes and sizes will flourish. And then so, so really to conclude, so if I'm going to sum up what should be done going forward, how do we, how do we ensure this vision of di European digital sovereignty comes to fruition? Um, there are many things that need to be done. I'm not going to list a, a long shopping list, but I would just call out um, three different things. So number one, um, we believe that Europe should really take a, a lead, and we're prepared to be part of taking that lead on developing new technologies such as Open RAN, which can fundamentally reshape um, how, to, how networks are, are structured. So it's a, it's a new way of providing network services where we can then have a better and more compelling suite of services to, to businesses in terms of how they have their own um, connectivity and manage their own connected factories, connected warehouses, whatever it might be. And um, so we think Europe should get behind that. The second area is, is really on, uh, on merger policy. We believe that a merger policy which takes into account very much the long-term um, incentives to invest um, and, and rebalances towards that um, will allow European businesses of scale and to take a greater role within the digital ecosystem. And finally, um, there, there is a, an ongoing debate around the balance of power between the US big tech, as was um, mentioned in the first question, and, and, um, and, and the European connectivity industry. Um, and we do believe that this needs to be looked at, at the redressing the, the imbalance in terms of power and recognizing those that value, get enormous value from the, um, from the networks that are being built should contribute to the, to the cost of, that, of those networks. And those three concrete steps which could be taken, we believe would be a, lot, a good, good progress in ensuring European digital sovereignty.